Hello. Are we on? I think actually we're being, uh, I, I don't know if I should say this because um, we've got some very, very calm speakers who aren't at all nervous or freaking out, uh, that we are uh, live. Are we live? Are we streaming? We're not streaming actually, guys. It's fine. Like, it's just in the room. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so, it's been such a great uh, start to the day, two hours of... I mean, I don't know how you guys are feeling, but that was quite a meaty session, I thought. And, um, and then there was the morning as well. Um, and uh, the lunch. And now we have Canon Tales. Canon Tales is uh, going to switch things up a little bit. Um, the main, the thing at the heart of Canon Tales is this question, what's your story? And all of the Canon Tellers that we have here, we have eight um, brilliant uh, storytellers. I mean, we are all storytellers uh, in our own ways, but these are people who uh, have, have made telling stories and sharing the stories of others uh, a, a, a key part of their, of their lives. And so Canon Tales is partly personal. It's about, it's about them as storytellers, but it's also about uh, the stories of the people that they encounter. And they work across so many different kinds of mediums, so many uh, different corners of the world, and it's, we're truly, truly privileged to have you all here. So thank you so much for taking this on uh, because they've been tasked with coming up with 20 images and each image has, will last for 21 seconds each. And the total running time is seven minutes. And once I press the button, uh, it, it's off, it's on. <laughs> uh, and it has a life of its own. Um, and then we, you know, we, we start to have a bit of a relationship. So. Uh, you know, let's go easy. <laughs> let's be prepared for anything. Um, and then, uh, you know, and let, let's go for a bit of a ride. Um, our, first, our first speaker is Alif Shafak, who many of you will know. Uh, she's a novelist. Uh, she's a, a political advocate and commentator. Um, she's an inspiration to anyone who hears her speaking, and not to put any further pressure on you, but... Um, truly an inspiration to so many people, including ourselves, and um, and as 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 is, is the perfect person to open up as someone who whose voice reaches across the world and inspires so many. So I'd like to welcome Alif up first. Um, please please come through, uh, and I'm going to press when I press the button. That's actually me. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, John Slack, uh, for those who don't know, um, and, uh, and, I, and I work with TLC. I, I work in, and with a lot of different people across uh, the, the book industry, um, and, but I've been working with Becky for, for many years now. We've done a few of these Canon Tales. In fact, Becky was in, I think, one of our earlier ones. She saw a Canon Tales and then wanted to do one here at Freeword, so we did a Freeword Canon Tales where all of the organizations in the building, uh, they all put a speaker forward. And we've been doing them for the last couple of years, and they're they're always very different. They're always utterly unique, um, and exciting and dynamic in their own ways. So uh, that's that's me. That's Canon Tales. And our first speaker, as mentioned, is Alif Shafak. And there's a little pop that's going to happen uh, as we step in. So why don't I ha hand it over to you, and please give a, a warm welcome. Thank you so much. And it will start on its own, yeah? I'm not touching anything. That's right. <laughs> okay, well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I want to talk a little bit about um, my journeys and uh, the cities and, and also the art of storytelling that has been part of my, my journeys. I was born in this city, in this very idyllic looking, very romantic city in France called Strasbourg. Uh, and the reason why I was born there is because my father was pursuing his PhD in, in philosophy, in political philosophy, and my mom had followed him to there. But the place where we lived wasn't the idyllic part of Strasbourg. It was something that looked like this. So it was the banyos where you could see lots of um, foreigners and immigrants and also students, leftist idealist students that had big ideas about the world. I remember it as a place where... <laughs> People used to smoke a lot, you know, turtlenecks, miniskirts, and smoking, altusar, um, and, you know, lo lots and lots of big ideas about the world. In fact, I sometimes believe that one of my earlier words was maybe not father or mother necessarily, but probably the, the French cigarette. 
couloirs. <laughs> and one of the words that was frequently uttered in that little flat crammed with students was the word freedom. They used to utter it a lot. And it remained with me, it stayed with me. They used to talk about how to save the world. But while they were busy saving the world, my parents could not save their own marriage. And shortly afterwards, the marriage failed. So together with my mother from Strasbourg, we, we took the train all the way back to Ankara and we never went back. My father stayed there. And then life changed, life changed radically. The neighborhood that I ended up in Ankara was my grandmother's neighborhood. And it looked a bit like this, two-story houses, uh, middle class, mostly Muslim. Actually, everyone was, it was a Muslim neighborhood, patriarchal, quite patriarchal, male-dominated, very, very conservative neighborhood. In this place, my mother and I ended up, and mom at the time had no diploma, no job, no career, nowhere to go to. And one of the things that remained with me about this neighborhood is the neighbors, especially female neighbors, <laughs> looking from behind the windows, and you know, they're getting Gaze, the gaze of the society and they were always watching particularly my mom because she was a 20 year old and she was a divorcee and they saw her as a threat to the status quo and the male order so quickly they started looking for an arranged marriage for my mother and because she was not a virgin anymore and she was not very favorable in the marital market uh, they were looking for someone who was older uh, preferably than than her um, and so while they were calling for possible suitors, it was my grandmother who intervened. And whenever I think about my grandmother, it's Emir Kustarika's, the time of the gypsies that comes to my mind, my mind, because she looks very much like this, my grandmother. She's very Eastern, very irrational, full of superstitions, herself not well educated, but very much believes in the education of her daughters. So it was this woman who intervened and he said, no, no, my daughter's going to go back to university and I'm going to take care of my granddaughter. And this is my grandmother's house in my memory. This is how I remember her house. Because it was full of irrationality. It was full of magic. And this was a time in Turkey when bombs were exploding on the streets. There were big political movements, clashes. People were dying on the streets and being tortured in prisons. But in my grandma's house, it was coffee cups, evil eye beads, you know, melting lead. It was a super a supernatural world full of stories, oral stories, and that too stayed with me. So for a long time I called my grandmother mother, and I called my own mother abla, which means big sister. One of the things that my grandma used to talk a lot about was the mountain calf. And this was a magical mountain. On that mountain there was equality, gender equality, no injustice, no gaps. And I, when I, whenever I told her, how do you get there, she would tell me, you have to find your own way. And I think, in time, I began to think, well, I'm going to find my way to the mountain calf through books. I loved books. I discovered books at an early age. But then I started school, and something happened. I hated school. School was horrible, and uh, it was not only the discipline that put me off, but the ideology of sameness. This was a school where the windows were painted halfway through gray. And so there was a part of me that always wanted to climb on those rocks that were, you know, forbidden. There was a part of me that always wanted to find a way out of that discipline. One of the things that made me unhappy, I think, was um, unhappy was the fact that I was left-handed. And I was taught at school to use my right hand all the time. I found that very difficult. Only years later, when I purchased my first yellow typewriter, could my two hands talk to each other and I love that freedom you know the freedom of being able to write with a typewriter or a computer I traveled a lot afterwards with my mother we went to Spain to Jordan Germany in my early 20s I came to this city believing that it called me I think some cities do call us or we believe they do so and I fell in love with Istanbul you know this was a city waiting with 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 stories waiting to be told secrets waiting to be discovered also it was a city of urban amnesia and my first night in Istanbul I never forget I had moved on my own no curtains on the on the windows and I saw a transvestite walking down a very steep street her heel one of her heels had been broken and she was swearing and she was crying and I thought what a wonderful city this is where where women can swear so loudly, but what a cruel city it must be where women and transvestites are crying in the middle of the night. 
And I felt very attached to Istanbul. I also felt very suffocated by it. I ran away from Istanbul to Boston, Michigan, and then Tucson, Arizona, of all places. In each of these places, I wrote a different book. Tucson was amazing. It's the only place where you can't use a hot air balloon because the air inside the balloon, uh, sorry, outside the balloon is hotter than the one inside. Long story short, I think travel cities have always been part of my, my journeys, my learning process. I sometimes think about the word yurt, which in English means tent, but in Turkish it means tent and homeland. And I wonder, can we have portable homelands? And when people ask me, where is home? I always want to say homes, please, can it not plural? And at the age of nationalism, populism, tribalism, you know, when they want to put us into categories, there's a part of me that very much resists that. And I do know that at the end of the day, for storytellers, for writers, there's only one portable storyland, uh, one portable homeland, and that's storyland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Alif Shafak, thank you so much for that. Um, what a beautiful beginning. And um, we're now moving on to, to Giles, um, who uh, is a photographer uh, who um, has been documenting the work of NGOs uh, and stories of conflict across the world. And I'm going to invite Giles to come up. Perfect, perfect. So what, what was that? No, no. Oh. Hey, um, and as I said, you know, everyone here is working across so many different mediums and, and photography is Giles' medium. Uh, so, um, and it's perfect for something like Can and Tales. So I give you Giles. Um, so my story begins uh, 25 years ago when I was given a camera, an Olympus OM-10. It was to change my life completely. At 18, I ne knew nothing about photography. Um, I was so excited by it. I won't go into the whole story about how I became a music photographer, fashion photographer, got depressed, went up and down. But 15 years later, I finally found what I wanted to do with my photography, which was to tell the stories of other people. I always say photography is quite simple. You just point a camera in the right direction and press a button. It just took me 35 years to work out which direction. Um, I work with NGOs documenting conflicts around the world. In 2011, I was in Afghanistan uh, documenting the impact of war on civilians there, when I too quite literally uh, took a footstep the same as those I've been documenting. I stepped on an IED, um, that's me lying there. I was looking up at the trees, I could see my boxer shorts there thinking, that's not a good sign. Um, miraculously, um, I survived, but I lost both my legs um, and my arm. I was flown back uh, to the UK, to Birmingham Hospital. I spent the next 37 days there in intensive care. Um, after 37 days, miraculously, I was still alive. But actually, that's when things got really, really hard. I had lost my identity. Um, I was told I would never walk again. I would never live independently. And what I found hardest is now everybody saw me as a disabled person. My whole perception of life had changed completely. Um, I had no idea really what I was going to do. But I knew there was one thing. Even when I arrived back in the UK, just days after my injury, in and out of consciousness, the only words I uttered were, I am still a photographer. And I knew to get my story back, I had to find a way to return to work. Um, so I went through months and months of rehab. But as I say, what was very difficult is now I was quite literally the story. My first exhibition after I got injured was called Becoming the Story. I had to fight that. Um, I learned how to walk again. Um, I went through, say it was about a year in rehab, 37 operations in that first year. Um, eventually I could walk. I learned how to make these strange grimacing faces as well. Um, while I was in hospital, I remember watching, just weeks after I got injured, the war in Syria began. Um, as I went through my year, two years of rehabilitation, I kept thinking this was the most important story of my career and I had to find a way to tell it. So after two, three years, um, I was well enough to go back to work and I went to Lebanon to document some of the most vulnerable refugees living there. People like Aya, 
Aya, who's four years old with spina bifida, uh, living as a refugee there. I don't like to show people as victims, though. And in fact, she's the feistiest four-year-old I know. In, she was here being carried by her sister going, donkey, faster, faster. <laughs> um, on that trip, I met people like Reem. Reem had been at home when a rocket hit her house, killing her husband next to her in the bed. One of her children also died, and she lost her leg. She was living on a fourth floor of an unfinished building. And I met Kalud. Um, Kalud had been at home, um, out in a garden, tending vegetables, when a sniper shot her in the spine. When I met her, she was living in this makeshift tent. I said, Kalud, what's your one hope for the future? And she said, I just want to be a mother again. Last year, um, I was asked by the UNHCR to document the refugee crisis across the Middle East um, and Europe. I started in Lesvos, uh, where scenes many people will be familiar of boats landing. But the UNHCR gave me the most amazing brief. They said simply, Giles, follow your heart. And I knew for me to follow my heart, I'd have to return to Lebanon and see what had happened to the families I documented there two years before. Um, so um, earlier this year, I went back to Lebanon. Um, I went to see Reem. She now had her kids living with her on the rooftop. She was able to get up and down the stairs. In many ways, life was going on, but for all refugees, the 1.5 million refugees living in Lebanon, life is in limbo. Um, Sarah, her young daughter, was there. Um, I asked her, what's your favorite thing to do at school? What do you enjoy, um, your friends? And she looked at me and she said, I don't go to school. I have no friends. And for four years, she has not even played with another child her age. And that is the reality for many refugees. Of course, on this trip, um, I also went back uh, to visit Aya and her family. Um, they had moved out of the tent that they were in, um, and they were now um, living in some sort of makeshift buildings. Um, Aya was exactly the same, just as feisty as ever. Um, the next picture, you'll see her being pushed in a wheelchair, going, faster, donkey, faster. Um, but again, like many families, um, like Reem, she is stuck in limbo. She's not able to go to school. Her parents can't work. For all these refugees, in many ways, their life is over. They are stuck. On the last day, I got a phone call. Um, it was from Kalud's family, the woman who had been paralyzed by a sniper. Um, they said, we're here, you're in Lebanon, she'd love to see you. I said, where is she? And they said, well, she's in the same place you saw her two years ago. I said, in that same tent? And they said, yes. My heart stopped. I felt sick. I said, but how can she still be there? Of all the people I met, Kalud and her husband, Jamal, were the most vulnerable. And I thought, as a photographer, I tried to tell their story, and nothing's changed. I failed them. So when I went to visit Jamal and Kalud, I burst into tears, and I said to them, I have let you down. I tried to tell your story, and nothing has happened. Nothing has changed. And Jamal hugged me, and we sat there, and we chat, and we said, no, we knew you'd come back. We believed in you. What could, all I could do was take more photographs. All I could do was try and tell their story again, which is what I did um, in these photographs. It's a house that, despite all their hardships, is full of laughter. But you imagine Kalud. She has not moved from that bed in over two years, staring in a windowless room at the ceiling. And yet she still laughs every day. Uh, the kids are amazing. One of the things I always do when I travel is I take back the photographs of people I've done before. On the last day, I was, do I give this photograph to Kalud and Jamal? Because the photograph I'd taken them of two years ago was exactly the same as was now. And I thought, what are they going to do to see that same picture? But I decided I had to give it to them. So I handed them the photograph. And I said, when I took this photograph, I did not take a photograph of a refugee. I did not take a photograph of a disabled woman. I took a photograph of a couple who were so deeply in love with each other. And that's where my story lies. My story lies in the stories of others. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Giles. And um, there's so much work, so much work to be done. Um, OK, so our. Next speaker. Make sure I've got my. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, one second here. Sorry. Uh, 
Okay, great. Kit. Uh, so Kit uh, writes about forgotten and overlooked places uh, uh, where the best stories are found, as she says. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, her debut novel, uh, my, Heart, my, uh, my Name is Leon, is just outside. And in fact, Giles's work is outside, and, um, and there's, a, there's plenty of books out there as well. So I'm cutting into your time, but I'm just going to start you again. Kit. Hello. Hi. Mine hasn't got a narrative as such, and they're two very hard acts to follow. But anyway, that's me. It's about 1965 with my sister. I'm the smaller child. Those two little badges there are gollywogs. And I thought they were fine little badges to have and I, until I went to school. And then I got called lots of names. And when people talk about the good old days, what they forget is that 20 years of equalities legislation has happened since I was born in 1960. So I don't think the good old days are the good old days. Fast. Um, I am a cat. You know, if you're a cat or a dog person, I'm a cat. And I don't mean I like cats. I mean, I am a cat. <laughs> and um, when I was about five, I realised I was a cat. I'm allergic to cats. But I definitely... Sorry, I'm a cat moving quickly on. I'm also addicted to water. I was 19 before I saw the sea or any body of water. And as soon as I got there, I thought, oh, my God, this is where I'm supposed to be. So every so often, about every three months or so, I feel very odd and I feel very strange and I have to go and find a body of water, sit by it, and I feel fine. That is actually what I want. If anyone knows how to knit anything, <laughs> knit me one of those where I can hide. As writers, we have this really, really inner sense of being away from the world and yet being seen, and I want one of those. See out, gin and tonic, sit there. It's just, it's the best photograph I know. This photograph was sent to me by my sister, and she said, she saw the photograph and she said, oh my God, Kit's going to love that. I saw it and I thought, oh my God, I love it. Now, what I love about that is that she knows me. She looked at that and when I saw it, I nearly cried. I don't know why, I don't know what it is about it, but it's me completely, utterly. And it's a beautiful thing to be known. This is another thing that inspires me. Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. Be most beautiful building. And Frank Lloyd Wright said, I do believe in God, but I call it nature. And he he designed so many beautiful buildings that were supposed to reflect uh, the landscape that they were in. And that's being fought over and not being maintained because his family is so horrible. I believe in small gestures that can do such a lot of good. That's a scene from Brief Encounter. That gesture of that man's hand on her shoulder is such an important one in the film. And yet it's a tiny, tiny thing. So I believe in, especially as writers, making small gestures that can have massive resonances, massive repercussions throughout our life. That's another small gesture that I made setting, setting up a scholarship. And that small gesture and that allowed things like the literary consultancy to jump on board, Penguin Random House, the Word Factory, loads of people got behind the scholarship. And the guy in the middle there is the first scholar of the scholarship, and it's going, hopefully, to revolution, revolutionise his life from a small gesture I made that everyone else got involved in. Everybody can read, so I'm not going to read that. You can read that for yourselves, because that's what I believe completely that we all can do different things with our life. We can't add an, a minute to it, not a second, but we can expand the reach of our lives and what we do with it and how much we get involved with the world. Pause for thought. I recently became single two years ago and found it really, really, really hard. And I saw this box of matches, made the bridges I burn like the way, and I thought, how fucking great is that? <laughs> It's just saying, get rid of it and let the light show you the way to go forward. And that's completely what I've done, and I feel so great about it. <laughs> women, strong women. What a fantastic picture. That warrior woman feeding her children, feeding herself. I just love it. It's a fantastic picture. It needs no words. I probably couldn't do it justice. Fantastic photograph. Pause. <laughs> I've caught up. I've caught up. Beautiful things we make out of paper as writers or as artists or whatever we do with paper, stationery shops generally, anything to do with paper, I'm addicted to it. And that is absolutely beautiful. Somebody's made that out of a piece of paper, just a wonderful, wonderful origami thing that I could never do. But paper means a great deal to me. I love books. I also love writing. And Ray Badbury said, quantity produces quality. If you only write a few things, you're doomed. And I believe that. I believe in writing and writing and writing. I enter competitions. I put my writing out there. I promote other people's writing because I think, get it out there. And 
in amongst the shit that you write, you'll have some really great things. I write at night, always. And that's what my writing's like. It's strong in the middle of the night. It's beautiful. I've set it down on the paper. It's got hidden depths. It's fabulous. It's got things to say. It looks like him. Uh, it's got masses of subtext. And then in the morning, when I wake up, that's what I wrote, actually. It's cobbled together. It's not fit for purpose. What was I thinking? It's got no plot. It needs to be destroyed. But nevertheless, I do try. And I, I mean, it's beautiful in its own way. It's got something to salvage, probably. Um, that's my brother, Dean. And he makes me laugh. He really, really, really makes me laugh, laugh if you're in London. But anyway, for me, it's laugh. He's been banned from my wedding. I'm banned from his wedding. Um, we can't be in the same room together. That's a family face, which I can do. I will do it later for anyone else that wants to see it. It's a bad photograph, and I'm really glad I've done that. Yellow Peril supports black power. What a fantastic photo from around uh, civil rights era. And for me, that's very inspirational about how we can support one another with whatever's going on. We're all, to some degree, involved in the terrible things that are going on in the world, even if we're only watchers and we feel we're only watchers, and yet we can support other people. That's me, contradiction. Little black dress and my boxing gloves. And I love that picture because I really, really feel it represents me, the two halves of me, or maybe the 50 different halves of me and the 50 different people I feel I am. That was for a photo shoot. And the guy said to me, you've got to look mean. And I, was, I really did look mean, I'll have to tell you another time. Be less productive, which is in, exactly in contradiction to write more stuff. And yet I love contradictions and I love the way that you can do nothing. And my favourite programme is Say Yes to the Dress, so Abby Morgan's as well. And I can be really unproductive when I'm watching Say Yes to the Dress and I can just zone out. And that's my motto. And I finish there. Thank you. <laughs> Head to all. Thank you so much. Uh, what, call to action. I'm feeling fired up. Um, okay, so that's the, you know, should I just stand here and kind of... Uh, why don't I bring up uh, Henny? Uh, you've, got, you've got time here. Uh, Henny is a writer and a, and a, and a graphic artist. Her, her, um, yes, I, I'm sort of, I'm just making a bit of the time before it switches over. There we go. Um, and uh, Hold in the Heart is out there as well. A very important book that was published earlier this year, which you're going to hear plenty about. Okay. Over to you, Henny. You've got a few extra seconds. Okay. This is very nerve-wracking, the timing bit of it. Um, okay, yes, I'm Henny Beaumont, um, as it says there. Uh, I'm going to try and show you four different projects that I'm working on at the moment. So this is all my own work. So the first little bit is photographs. Um, this is actually not from the project, but this is a photograph I liked. But the first stuff is um, from an app that I've been working on with a producer. So I'm the visual artist on a GPS-triggered app, uh, which is a trail around the reservoir in Stoke Newington, so the Woodbury Down Wetlands, it's called. So um, this is actually from the Walthamstow Reservoir, the, which we're trying to extend it to the Walthamstow as well. Um, and I walk along the new river which is not actually a river it's a um it's a, it's a culvert it was brought into london to bring fresh water to into london 400 years ago from james the first and i got obsessed with things in the water things that are floating in the water so i take photographs of things that are floating in the water in the in the new river and um i go back to them re-photograph them i mess around with them so i sort of digitally enhance them or i paint into them as well and um these are two of them <laughs> as you can see <laughs> it's a bucket and a cross i did this to show to my daughter last night and she went don't say that's a bucket because they can see that, but it, but it is a bucket. Because I, and also I make handmade books. So this is a little handmade book. It, this turned into an exhibition of my work called Things in the Water. So I make little handmade books. This, these are again images of things floating in the water. 
And at the same time I've been doing this, I started doing a, a big sketchbook, which uh, I used to call my Top Travels book, which was not really, this is from my Top Travels, which wasn't really any Top Travels. It was to do with um, taking my children to school and the dentists and hospitals. And it was a kind of supposed to be a guidebook to my life to uh, cheer me up and give me instructions of how to, so this one's about don't be late, which I failed always to follow, but... Um, it was in good intentions and this is an image from Rosilli in Wales um, and the instructions here is to uh, not just enjoy watching my children play but to go and swim in the water as well and um, something's going to come yeah right this one is from go taking my kids to music so on one side we used to love it there was a big church and it had instructions in the church so same sort of thing, but bad jokes and religious instructions. So like, love is grand, divorce is 20 grand. And in, in, we went into the church and made up a lie that my daughter was doing a religious project and said, could we have one of the posters? And these are from my studio. So again, this is more instructions about um, um, trying to keep a sort of sane head and not think your work is brilliant or rubbish, you know, to just sort of try and keep working, do some interesting work that you can enjoy and have fun with. So it's only aimed at me. Um, and this is from taking my daughter swimming lessons. And it's when I started to become more interested in things around my third daughter who's got Down syndrome. And I started making more work about the sorts of things I had to do with her and the kind of prejudices that I encountered with other people, but also in myself. And I started to want to write a book. And this is the book that I wrote, which is my graphic memoir. And uh, that's a picture, a painting I did of Bethy when she was about three and she'd drawn all over the floor. Um, and the book, the reason I want, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to read out a little bit of the book as it comes up. There we go. So, oh, shit, I can't do it. Uh, you'll need to watch her for signs of heart failure. If she fails to put on weight or has difficulty breathing, go straight to hospital. So this is from Great Ormond Street. And that's me and my husband, and that's a consultant. He's becoming a bit of a sort of godlike figure. Um, and then it's then I start saying, but how you know, how am I gonna watch her all the time? You know, if I um I've got two other kids to look after. And I suppose it's probably quite clear that I started to feel like I was drowning in um the difficulty of because it was a sudden, it was a shock finding out she had Down syndrome. We didn't, we hadn't anticipated it. Um, and he says, "Enjoy her as a baby. They don't stay little forever." And uh, this was his advice to us. And uh, get, because he was this sort of the consultant, I remember feeling like we had to hang on to every single one of his words. And he is supposed to be walking on water there in a sort of Jesus-like sort of way. So then I think, what does that mean? Is he saying she'll die, so we need to make the most of her now, or that she is going to be a hideous nightmare when she grows up, and will regret not loving her enough as a baby? And this is really all I managed to take in from the hospital, is the idea that uh, my life was over. Right, now this is a different chapter when Bethy's a bit older, so this is my teenage daughters, and she comes home and says, where's, where's mum? Working on her memoirs. <laughs> what? Mum, where is mum? She's working on her, oh, my life is so inconvenient because I have a disabled child book. That's what my daughter actually used to call the book, and she's pissed, to piss me off deliberately. Um, and this is Bethy saying, oh, oh, I might have to skip it. When can I marry Harry Styles, mum? Uh, I don't know, love. He'd have to want to marry you too. Mum, he does. <laughs> That's what about poor old Justin Bieber. And uh, I, this is new work, okay? So this is, uh, I haven't shown anyone before. So this is a little bit of a new, this is a fiction. So this guy's in therapy. And I'm just going to show you a little sequence. And I'll try and read it out again. And he's a bird watcher. And that's why he's daydreaming about birds. And it says... You're very quiet today. I'm wondering where you are. And he says, uh, I can't actually read it. <laughs> he basically says, I was looking at numbers at a newsagent. I'm really worried about being caught. And she says, uh, 
she says back to him, so you're very worried about ca being caught. What do you think would happen? Oh, phew. Because I probably would have those things. <laughs> <laughs> so he then says something about... Can anyone read it? Oh, yeah, she'd leave me, definitely. I feel terrible about it. I worry about being caught all the time. And she says, I'm wondering if you want to be caught. And he says, why do you say that? You must think I'm stupid. And she says, why on earth would I think you were stupid? And then she, he says, you think I'm terrible. And he says, no, but I'm still not sure if I can trust you. And she says something back. <laughs> 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 and she says, I think perhaps you find it difficult to trust anyone. So there you go. <laughs> Understandable. Thank you. Thank you, Henny. Thank you. Um, that was, that was easy, right? <laughs> okay, so um, moving on um, from the world of images uh, to the world of performance, and our next person, Mark Ball, has spent a, a great deal of time of his life uh, in uh, performance and is now the artistic director for Lift Festival, and is going to talk to you about that world. Mark. Thank you. Uh, wait for my first slide. This has been my experience of contemporary theatre for too long. Uh, uh, so my story is about how we must make the arts speak to more people than this, speak to more than just those in the bubble, speak to more than just people like us. It's about the, it's about the, pa it's about the power of the arts to transform us, to grow the most unlikely of people, and to help us to provide an understanding of the world around us. It's about, meeting, it's about reaching the crowd. Uh, it's about what I think is the kind of moral obligation that we have as artists and producers to transform as many people's lives as possible with wonderful experiences and thoughts. I think we're part of a social contract because let's face it, the vast majority of people who pay for the arts don't benefit from it. I'm really evangelical about this because the arts changed my life. I grew up in a house with few stories. I grew up in a house with science, with numbers and facts, where the arts had no meaning to me as a bookish, geeky teenage kid until one day I heard that man sing Hand in Glove in 1984, and it gave me the soundtrack to my teenage angsty life. A and also in 1984, I was taken as a school kid to the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, to see, very fortunately, Anthony Scher play Richard III. I thought I would hate it, that it wouldn't speak to me, but it was the single most powerful, visceral, fiercest experience of my young life. For the first time, it made me, feel, it made me think about the complexity of our human lives. So my career has been dedicated to making the arts reach big, to connect to that kid who experienced Morrissey. And I'm going to gallop through some projects. Ballet on the buses says what it does in the tin. It's not ballet in an opera house. It's ballet where people can experience it. This is Birmingham Royal Ballet, put on buses, traveling around central Birmingham. Uh, this is a project called the, the, the Great Swallow. I did it first a few years ago in Birmingham. A seven-day, 24-hour story about one man's futile attempt to, to take flight, but not in a theatre, not in a gallery, sighted 30 metres in the air on Birmingham's iconic rotunda building, and 300,000 Brummies saw it. They looked up from their daily commute or shop and experienced the city in a new, strange way. Another project, Naming Lights, a national competition to ask the public who deserved in this age of celebrities to have their names written in lights? Who could we celebrate as an everyday hero? 20,000 written entries, one winner whose name was fabricated in 18 foot high illuminated letters and put on top of Birmingham Central Library for six weeks. A story for the whole city, who was Una White? And I'm sure you many will, will have seen this. Play Me, I'm Yours, Pianos Over the City. I started that project with an artist called Luke Duram in Birmingham in 2007 with seven pianos. 11 years later, uh, this, this has now reached 10 million people worldwide with 1,500 pianos uh, installed over 50 cities across the globe bearing the simple instruction, play me, I'm yours. Quentin Crisp, his story completely inspired me. As a young queer kid growing up, his story gave me confidence to be myself. A slight aside, I never thought I'd end up working with him. I did. In 2009, I produced his UK tour. The night before opening night, I went into his bedroom and he was dead in bed. 
uh, uh, sometimes, like, sometimes life does not go to plan, and you learn a lot from, the, from, some, of, from, from some of the tough things that hurt. Social media platforms give us, a new, give us new ways to reach big. When I did end up working at the RSC, uh, I, I, I made them go into social media uh, and make content on social media. We made, rather cornerly, such tweet sorrow, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, uh, on Twitter, extending the RSC's global reach, reaching loads of new audiences. And now I'm delighted for the past six or seven years to have been at Lyft, the London International Festival of Theatre, which is all about storytelling. Stories through theatre, stories that shine a light into the, some of the darkest corners of our world, stories that reveal and educate and, and entertain, stories that celebrate our difference, but also what we have in common. Stories like Minefield, uh, which after a London run opened in Buenos Aires last night. Uh, stories by six, told by six former soldiers, three British and three Argentinian, about what it's like to go to war, to fight each other on the battlegrounds of the Falklands, and then to spend the next 30 years somehow trying to get on with your life. A story that shows that theatre absolutely builds a bridge. Or Romeo and Juliet in Baghdad, rehearsed and made under protection in the green, the green zone in Baghdad. A familiar story reclaimed but told to London's, but, but the told London's audiences of the politics and war and love and division across Sunni and Shia communities in Baghdad. And that brought people together who identified differently as Londoners, as Arabs, as Muslims, to understand and share an experience. Uh, another project that we did, 66 Minutes in Damascus, which took you into the heart of a Syrian detention center. People suspended their, their, their disbelief so much with this project that a couple, of before, a couple of audience members actually hit their interrogator physically. Uh, uh, it was a project that really made visible the deplorable truths around Syria and confronted us with our own responsibility to it as Westerners. Uh, and then in 2012, we did a project that left 100% London, putting 100 people on stage who perfectly represented the demographics of London through the census. 100 people recruited over 100 days, one person at a time, putting the stories of businessmen, young girls, refugees and retirees side by side to really peel away at the human layers of the city. Stories can also be intimate. This is a really intimate story. We all tell each other stories at the hairdressers. It's common knowledge. Uh, uh, haircuts by children. We trained 10 10-year-old children to cut adults' hair. And we opened a salon where they offered free haircuts over the weekend for adults. Uh, a brilliant way to connect and share stories between adults and children. They dyed my hair blue. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, because it's not part of my story, I want that epic reach of Lyft. It, Lyft, Lyft tells you important stories of climate change, but really, simply, but really simply sometimes, we install a number of, uh, of really elegant blue neon rings around, around major London landmarks that, that showed where water level rises would be in the next 100 years. Uh, and again, Luke Duram, uh, a project called the Sky Orchestra. How do you deliver a mass musical project to a dreaming public underneath? Well, you play it from hot air balloons flying over London at dawn. Uh, uh, and a flotilla of hot air balloons flew in 2014 over London. Everybody loved this project, except Jeremy Clarkson, who wrote in the Sunday Times how he'd heard the project. It woke him up, it woke him up and he wanted to shoot the balloons down. Uh, and probably our most kind of epic project, putting a bunch of insane American daredevil dancers in the spokes of the London Eye for a spectacular Olympic project. All of these stories are, are about returning, returning stories, their joy, their infectiousness, their politics and their provocations back to people so that they can help shape and enhance their understanding of the world. Theatre changed me, music changed me, stories changed me. I don't know what I'd have become, I don't know what that boy would, would have become without Morrissey or without Shakespeare, but I'm really glad that that boy has become this man who's able to share my story with you today. Thank you. And we are all very lucky for it. And Lyft Festival, and some incredibly inspiring work in there and uh, another fantastic year this year as well. Um, so our next speaker is Margaret Busby, and uh, who is a writer, editor, broadcaster, and critic who uh, set up Alison and Busby uh, in 1967 and is gonna tell you a little bit about that. With no fear. With no fear, okay. Well, can you hear me? Right, I'm going to start at the beginning, which is my earliest memory of engaging with words. And uh, I was four years old. I was in Ghana, where I was born. And these, this is my cousin David, who was then teenage. He was teaching my elder brother to, sp to, to spell long words. And these are the first three words I remember learning how to spell. Fascinating, necessary, and picturesque. <laughs> and uh, I think that was a sort of metaphor for life. But armed with these words, my, my siblings and I were dispatched to Britain 
um, to boarding school because my father was a, a doctor in the bush and there were no schools there. So we went from that to, to that and uh, my father had got this thing about the English education from having been a scholarship boy in Trinidad and he was at Queen's Royal College with people like C.L.R. James uh, who's in that picture and my father. And so uh, I went to Britain, um, well it was not, not uh, sometime after the Windrush got there in 1948 when 492 migrants had come to the West Indies, but my, my, my family, my grandfather had been in Britain in 1899 studying law, my mother was a, doc, was a nurse in the 30s in, in Britain, there she is at the South Bank of the Festival of Britain. And we spent school holidays with a, a writer in, in Sussex who um, wrote a book. I, in fact, that was my first editorial work, was helping her with her, her, her manuscripts. And she wrote a memoir called No Kidding, where children was filmed. That's me in the middle there, in, looking like an Indian chief. And it was through her, her daughter, who also became a writer, and had a party at the 100 Bayswater Road where Peter Pan was written and her cousin lived. And that's where... Rachel was having an engagement party as well, and she, her fiancé had a friend I was introduced to who's called Clive Allison. And I was at university, and, and we said, what are you going to do when you graduate? I said, we might go into publishing. Why don't you start a publishing company? And I have to say, it was any um, business, because I was already engaged to a jazz musician. This is him in Cambridge with Ed Victor, in case anybody knows Ed Victor. That was in the 60s. And so we met up, and, and we started publishing decided that what we wanted to do was cheap poetry paperbacks. We wanted to make them affordable, it, not rather than expensive, slim hardbacks. So these were the first three paperback poetry we did. We, had, we didn't know anything about print runs or anything. Um, we tried names on, on the Board of Trade. We weren't allowed any names except Allison and Busby. At least it was A and B, not Q and W. So we had to pick our own names. And we, we had 15,000 copies of these paperbacks. No distribution. We knew nothing about selling it. We, we were bold in our audacity, got lots of publicity, and we decided to both have jobs in other publishing companies to work to, to earn money. I, I was with Crescent Press, uh, I worked along Crystal McNahose, and we found a novel that we wanted to go full time with called The Spook Who Sat By The Door. So we gave up our jobs in 1967, in 1969, and Spook became our first book. Um, this is, we, we had an office in, first of all, in, in our 11 Fitzroy Square, which later became Ian McEwan's house, and then we ended up in Soho in 6A Noel Street, and uh, there's still a massage parlor next door. <laughs> and that was our first catalogue. This was our first full-time book. I did the cover with Letra Set. It was called The Spooker Sat by the Door. It was very, we sold American rights. We persuaded the observer to do uh, extracts. Um, in fact, the, the Evening Standard were convinced that, he, that the book was read by the people who kidnapped Patty Hearst, so... It obviously was quite an influential book. It went on to be filmed, and we published what we wanted. This, I like this uh, cartoon by, by um, Posey Simmons because it says, uh, it's just beautifully written. I know it won't sell, but why shouldn't we publish it? <laughs> In fact, Posey's husband, Richard Hollis, did some of our jackets. And we, we, went, we did lots of things. Um, we found books in other people's... Um, dustbins and pubs. Um, we rescued books from oblivion. This was C.L.R. James, who had been at school with my father. He was out of print. We reprint a lot of his books. And uh, we, we rescued a lot of titles, and we nurtured new authors as well as reprinting things. Uh, some of the authors we, we did um, were Buccia Machetta, um, Jill Murphy, who was writing about witches and schools long before J.K. Rawlings. And Michael Moorcock won the Guardian Fiction Prize in 1977, and Roy Heath won it in 1978, 1977, 1978. So it was a bit like um, One World winning the Man Booker, two years running, little independent winning prizes. And uh, among the other writers we published, well, some of them are Ishmael Reed, um, Anthony Burgess, Adrian Mitchell, J.G. Ballard, George Lamming, Chester Himes, Fella, Michelangelo, Dr. Johnson, Nuruddin Farah, Colin McInnes. Um, and we published this book, Miyamoto Musashi, written in 1645 and now an international bestseller. And as someone said, you never knew what Alison Buzzy was going to do next, but you knew they were going to be interesting. And we, we did a couple of hundred titles while I was the editorial director. Then I moved on. This is uh, one of the... Alison Buzzy went through various, various phases. Afterwards, this is Susie Dunmock, who currently is the publishing director. 
Peter Day, who died, who at one point was the managing director. I left in 1992, uh, 1987, went on to be uh, editorial director of EarthScan. Then I went freelance in 1992, and I'd been obviously concerned about women's writing, African women's writing. So a letter from Wallace Yinka in 1975, I'd been telling him he didn't have enough women in his anthologies. Uh, and 17 years later, I did my own Daughters of Africa. And meanwhile, to, to subsidize the publishing habit, I'd been doing things like broadcasting for the BBC since the 60s. Um, and uh, so it was a pretty, pretty um, full life. I also did things like... Uh, uh, ooh. <laughs> I can't remember. Dawson, <laughs> yeah, along the way, I, I judged prizes. I got a few prizes. In fact, one of the things about this prize, they obviously needed the proof, proofreader. I've, there's a prize here to Margaret Bubsy. <laughs> don't know who that is. And so, um, the Daughters of Africa was, was, some, was published 25 years ago, and in, in fact, it's now going to be reissued. And so, what next? Well, um, maybe I will write, write, do some more writing. This is when I first published my very first article in 50 years ago. I got a letter from an agent saying, um, you write well, would you like to continue writing? Well, maybe I will, and uh, maybe I'll turn to literary consultancy, and um, <laughs> maybe I'll need some help and find that the challenges ahead will be fascinating, necessary, and picturesque. <laughs> Uh, we are surviving and we are thriving. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to have to squeeze our next speaker out, um, Abby Morgan. Who? So, uh, Abby works across an uh, incredible uh, range of uh, formats, and uh, from playwriting to TV to film, and uh, is going to be sharing a bit of that. I think I might have broken this. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it like that. Abby Morgan. Thank you. Oh my God, oh, can you hear me all right? It's just, it's, can you hear all right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Perfect. This is only adding to the nervous build-up, isn't it? Um, okay. Can we get a hand? Sorry. I don't mind, I can hold it if you want. Okay. Let's start again. Should we start again? Sorry. Okay, uh, I'd like to start this penguin chocolate biscuits. Really what it relates to is um, I learned how to lie very early on and this is really a marker for me. I love chocolate biscuits and uh, I ate a whole packet and I remember I lied and told my mother the story of how uh, my brother had eaten the chocolate biscuits <laughs> and this story went on and on and on and she believed me and, uh, uh, and it was fascinating to me. People always ask, you know, uh, what's your story? Where do you come from? Well, the truth about me is I was born in Wales but I don't feel I'm from there. My parents, my grandparents were all from Wales, but I was the child of actors, and so we toured around everywhere. And yet somehow, when I get drunk, I go into a Welsh accent. So <laughs> somewhere in me, it's still there. Uh, and I, the reason why I travelled is my father was a theatre director, my mother was an actress, and so I genuinely spent most of my life... I went to seven different schools, and uh, we moved around, and it meant I was very chameleon, but oddly I was an incredibly introverted child, and so I was surrounded by actors. My sister's an actress, I'm married to an actor, my mother's an actor, my father's an actor, my, my brother-in-law's an actor. Uh, but I loved, but I loved the, uh, the, the world of the theatre, and the thing that I discovered most of all is I love story, and I love seeing plays, and then I discovered television. And uh, the 70s was a time where you never turned the television off, you always had it on. And so what I loved about television was it was where I could be utterly alone with stories and not ever have to perform. I was never surrounded by my mum saying, get up, do a song, do a song. And the, the, sh the shows that I loved were The Two Ronnies, and I loved Morecambe and Wise, and I loved Tales of the Unexpected. I loved the twist of the tales. And I used to creep down when my brother went to bed, and I used to sit and watch TV with my mum, and it was incredibly bonding. Um, because she was married to a theatre director and because she was alone a lot of the time. And I realised that t television was great company. And it was great company for me because finally, after my parents divorced, we ended up in Stoke-on-Trent, uh, which is an interesting place. Uh, and there are two things I know about Stoke-on-Trent, which is it was a very different world for me. And it meant that I was permanently at school for a while. And it was a revelation to me because I really discovered I hated, hated, hated school. And I didn't 
really go. I very rarely turned up for school because I would stay at home and watch more television. And the shows that I loved and the films that I loved that I then started to discover were mainly the films that were, came out just when I was born and I rewatched them. And they were Cares and they were Kathy Come Home and they were Abigail's Party and they were all these incredible directors, incredible writers who really, really inspired me. And I realized not, uh, the reason why they inspired me was that they related so much to the world I came from, the world I was around. And it was a time of change. You know, I came out of um, of school and it was a, a terrific moment when I came up to school and the wall was coming down and that was really exciting because suddenly the world was opening up to me and I suddenly realized that there was this world beyond the confines of um, TV really and I started to travel and I went to live in Florence and I must be the only person in the world who absolutely hated Florence <laughs> and the thing I realized is is that I'm happiest when I'm surrounded by misery and beauty makes me really 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 unhappy um, and so, but I got a terrific year out of it because terrible things happened to me and it became amazing material. Uh, and I still, and, and I've ended up buying a house out there, which is an irony. Um, and then I graduated finally from university because I also hated university. There's a running theme here, which is I really hated education and it wasn't because I hated the conformity of it. And so the moment that I graduated was a revelation to me because suddenly I discovered freedom. And it's a word that I've heard repeated here today. And it's vital for a writer because you don't always fit. And so freedom at that point was what was I going to do next? And I was sitting on a train and I saw a woman eat a lettuce, <laughs> a whole lettuce on her own. And um, I'd been in a play, and I got my mum to see me, and my sister to see me, and I got her husband to see me, and I said, do you think I could act? And they came off the stage and went, no, you can't act. But the writing was really good, and I wrote a monologue about a woman eating this lettuce. And, uh, and so I had, I'd sort of started to cover, discover writing, and at the same time, through Becky Swift, who was a daughter who's here today, uh, who was the daughter of a very good friend of my mother, she got me a week at Virago Press. And it was one of the greatest gifts she ever gave me because it made me realize I never want to work in an office again. Uh, <laughs> So I discovered waitressing, and uh, I discovered you could make money from waitressing, and I discovered you could meet incredible people waitressing. And I waitress waitressed for a decade. I was the oldest waitress in town. And while I was waitressing, I was writing, but more than that, I was meeting incredible people. And the people I've met, I've ended up working with. One of my friends I met there is now a terrific film editor, another is an amazing director. It was an incredible time as well. It was the 90s, it was this kind of cool Britannia thing. I was totally uncool, but I felt like everyone around me was having a good time. Uh, and I remember thinking, again, I don't fit. What's wrong? I don't fit. And the only thing I had at that time was writing. And the only thing I had was observation. And the only thing I had was that sense of there's something bigger, there's something more important happening in the world. And there was. You know, out of this incredible revolution, this period of, of change, there had also been a hell of a lot of conflict. And I kept on being drawn back to the misery and drawn back to the pain and drawn back to the truth and drawn back to stories. And... Um, at that time, it was, uh, I started to look back at, at, at lots of that period. And in particular, I started to look back at dictatorships. And so I wrote, one of my first plays was called Splendor, and it was for four women. And it was about one night uh, in the life of a dictator's wife on the eve of revolution where she's been deserted by her husband. And the only company she has is her best friend who hates her, an uh, interpreter who is working on the other side, and a war photographer who is here to take the photo of her husband. But from that, I had my audience again. And I had an audience in the way that I'd had my mother at the beginning, and she'd listened to my lie. And I realized the great thing I needed to do was to observe truth, create fiction, and find facts. And if I distilled those facts, I would find a kind of truth. And so I started to find story everywhere, everywhere I looked. I found stories in sex trafficking. I found stories in uh, the Muslim community, in the white Muslim community in Bradford. I found stories in the tsunami, and I found stories in the 50s in the BBC. And the reason why I wrote the, the Hour, which was a TV show I wrote, is because I was really interested in the Suez Crisis. And I thought, how do I get a mainstream audience to look at the Suez Crisis? So I thought, well, I'll write it around a kind of romantic drama. And from that, I realized that actually the thing I'm most interested in are people, and I'm interested in the lives of others. I've always been interested in the lives of others. And so um, when people say, why did you write about Margaret Thatcher, and how could you have written Shame if you've written Margaret Thatcher, and how could you then go to look at the life of Dickens? And it's because, for me, it all comes back to the same thing, which is I'm looking for the truth of story, and I'm looking for the truth of people's lives. And the thing that was very important for me is that when I wrote... 
suffragette was I suddenly realized my whole life I thought I'd been a charlatan and I thought that all we ever did was entertainment and it was the first time I realized that at a time when Hillary Clinton has failed to get into the presidency votes for women is really important I could suddenly bring my truth and it had importance and it wasn't just about stealing a packet of chocolate biscuits so Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, okay, our, fav our final speaker, Ray uh, Antropos, please come to the stage. Um, Ray is a, a poet. He is an educator. Uh, and um, he is here today to, to tell us his story. Ray. Good luck. Right. Hello. Um, so because I was uh, only a kid, at first I felt kind of excited and it was all a mystery, felt so new. I had this thing I had to work out, a new discovery in my life. When I went to school, the attention I received was very negative. The focus from teachers was, poor you, you're disabled, you have these knees now. And I was embarrassed. And I was even more embarrassed when in class I had to sit next to a support teacher who spoke really loudly uh, and all the other children would look at me and they'd be like, what's wrong with Raymond? Uh, he's fine in the playground and he's got this woman in the, all of the classes just shouting, speaking very loudly at him. Um, and I had this, this teacher who would also, a maths teacher would always be standing there and she would say very loudly, Raymond, you need to open your book. <laughs> and it would always confuse people um, yeah, <laughs> and it confused me. Um, and it made me feel like a dunce. It led the other kids, uh, it led to a lot of bullying. Um, it led to what's called the um, assault of language, the pathologizing of, of, of language um, in a way that I think really af af affected me. Um, <sighs> I felt... I felt guilty for not being able to assert myself. Um, my dad is, is Jamaican, and he, he was very old school Jamaican. He would say things like, stand up for yourself, um, make yourself heard, and, uh, you know, he, he would say, if someone challenged you, you had to rise to that challenge. Um, and I struggled with that for years. Uh, and that's not to say I didn't have supportive family. I did. It's just they themselves were lost in how to make sense in what I was going through. My parents were struggling with it. My school didn't know what to do. This was something I had to figure out on my own. So imagine being told that something exists to everyone else, but it doesn't exist to you. How can you believe what you can't hear? There's no proof. I found out I was deaf by people saying to me, why aren't you answering the doorbell or telephone? Why aren't you answering me? Why aren't you listening? I don't understand. I didn't understand what they were talking about. I had no idea what these sounds were. As I went through school, I had no concept that deafness could be a strength or that deafness could be a way of being and connecting to the wider deaf community, which is one rooted in language nationally and internationally. 90% of deaf people are born to hearing parents. Out of that 90%, one in five parents will learn British Sign Language. The base for our language acquisition starts from what we hear in the womb, right up to seven years old. Without this base of language acquisition, which is mostly received secondhand, it is difficult for deaf people to build their own language. Over 70% of the UK's current deaf, deaf population is something called functionally illiterate. I'm currently a, a poet in residence at a deaf school in North London. I've learned BSL, British Sign Language. I use more um, SSE, which is Sign Assisted English, um, so I can interact with students and help them examine their lives in their own language. Um, I've written a series of poems I'm going to try and squeeze in. Uh, has anyone been to Gaudi Church? Has anyone done the audio guide? No? Okay. Oh, I'm, I haven't got time to explain it. I'm just going to read the poem. 
echo. My ear amps whistle like they are singing to echo, goddess of noise, the raveled knot of tongues of blaring birds, consonant crumbs of dull doorbells, sound swamped in my misty hearing aid tubes. No time. When I do this, just say what? A word that keeps looking in mirrors like it is in love with its own volume. What? I am a one-word question, a one-man patience test. What? what language would we speak without ears? What? Is paradise a world where I hear everything? What? How will my brain know what to hold if it has too many arms? With <laughs> day. Nice. The day I clear out my dead father's flat, I throw boxes of molding LPs, Garvey, Malcolm X, Mandela, speeches on vinyl. I find a TDK cassette tape on the shelf, smudge green ink labeled Raymond speaking. I play the vintage cassette, I play it, I play the tape and hear my two-year-old voice chanting my name, Antrob, and my dad's laughter crackling in the background, not knowing the word boss. I ain't got time. My dad, was a, my dad was a sermon, uh, he was a minister. Uh, this is one of his sermons. I have a whole box of them at home um, and I've been writing. And um, I, you know what, I ain't got time for the poems. I'm just gonna speak. So um, when sitting in church, in Sunday church, Celestia, <laughs> uh, goddess of salt water. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, and no one knew what I was missing until a doctor gave me a handful of Lego and said to put a brick on the table every time I heard a sound. After the test, I held enough bricks in my hand to build a house and call it my sanctuary. Call it the reason I sat in saintly silence during my grandfather's sermons where he preached the good news I only heard as Babylon's babbling echoes. Woo! And there's a, there's a quote. Uh, oh, right. Oh, you froze. <laughs> Sorry. Catch up? No. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, there's a quote. If you can't catch nothing, then something wrong with your ears. They've been tuned to the wrong frequency. My favorite poet, Kai Miller, said that. So maybe I belong to the universe underwater, where all songs are smeared wailings for Silesia, goddess of salt water, healer of infected ears, which is what the doctor thought I had since deafness did not run in the family, but came from nowhere. I just don't have time, I'm going to drink someone else's water. <laughs> All right. Dear Hearing World, this is a, um, a, a letter I wrote to the Hearing World after working in deaf schools. Dear Hearing World, I have left Earth in search of sounder orbits, a solar system where the space between a star and a planet isn't empty. I have left a white beard of noise in my place and many of you won't know the difference. We are indeed the same volume. All of us eventually fade. I have left Earth in search of an audible God. I do not trust the sound of yours. You would not recognize my grandmother's hallelujah if she had to sign it. You would have made her sit on her hands with a ruler in her mouth as if measuring her distance from holy. Take your God back. Though his songs are beautiful, they are not loud enough. I want the fate of Lazarus for every deaf school you've closed, every deaf child whose confidence has gone to a silent grave, every BSL user who has seen the annihilation of their language. I want these ghosts to haunt your tongue-tied hands. I have left earth. I am equal parts sick of your, oh, I'm hard of hearing too. Just because you've been on an airplane or suffered head colds, your voice has always been the loudest sound in a room. I call you out for refusing to acknowledge sign language in classrooms, for assessing deaf students on what they can't say instead of what they can. They did not ask to be part of the hearing world. I can't hear my joints crack, but I can feel them. I am sick of sounding out your rules. You told me I breathe too loud, but it is rude to make noise when I eat. Sent me to speech therapist, said I was speaking aloud language of holes. I was pronouncing what I heard, but your judgment made all my syllables disappear. Your magic master trick, hearing world, drowning out the quiet, bursting all speech bubbles in my graphic childhood. You were glad to benefit from audio supremacy. I tried hearing people. I tried to love you, but you laughed at my deaf grammar. I used commas, not full stops, because everything I said kept running away. I mewled over long paragraphs because I didn't know what a natural break sounded like. You erase what could have always been poetry.
Strike that out, write it again. You erased what could have always been poetry. Taught me I was inferior to standard English expression. I was a broken speaker. You were never a broken interpreter. Taught me my speech was dry for someone who just sounds like they're underwater. And it took years to talk with a straight spine and mute red marks in the coursework you assigned. Deaf voices go missing like sound in space. Now I've left Earth to find them. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Who else is, is anyone else's mind kind of just blown? <laughs> like, <sighs> you guys are just incredible. Um, we've been so lucky that you've, that you've taken time, that you've put the time into this. And you've uh, you've brought it home, and you've uh, what a way to finish the day. Um, so I'm just going to go through everyone again, just one more time, so that everyone can just show appreciation. So Raymond Antropus, <laughs> Mark Ball, <laughs> Margaret Busby. Henny Beaumont, Giles Dully, Kit DeWall, Abby Morgan, and Elif Shafak, who has had to take a plane away from here to find another place and carry on. Um, I'm feeling galvanized, I'm feeling ready to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something, damn it. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to Becky just for some final thoughts. Thank, thank you, John, and thank, thank you, Canon Taylor. That was absolutely brilliant and really, really fascinating. And I just love the way it moves between modes, and it's just, it's just riveting, riveting for the audience. So thank you. Um, yeah, I ju we just want to wrap up, really, because um, those of you that have been here all day, thank you so much for hanging in for both parts. Um, we had a really, I thought, a really excellent conversation this morning. Am I shouting? No, it's official now. Final thoughts. <laughs> it's like a caption. Uh, I don't understand. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just in my own space here. You carry on. Yeah, John's, on, John's <laughs> taken drugs or something. I don't know. No, he has. He's very, he, that's why I love him. He's full of emotion. We all are at TLC. Anyway, um, the thing is, uh, I, I've lost my thread now. Uh, and I don't even have a poem to read, like, off the top of my head. Um, no, I just wanted to say that the conversation this morning, I thought, I mean, why I selected John Cook is because he does have a very strange capacity to deepen a conversation. And it's not an easy thing to do. And when we first mooted the idea, when we were first discussing what would be a good way of marking today, we wanted to have a conversation where we genuinely heard from um, everybody that's come. You're not even an audience, you're colleagues, essentially. That's how I think of you. So, um, so, uh, so it just was very important to have somebody who could uh, kind of keep all that together in their heads. And um, I ju he's, uh, I, I ju uh, John, you're still in the room. My God, I'm talking about you as if you're, I don't know, gone back to Norwich. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you did that so exquisitely. And, you know, that feeling of the conversation properly deepening where we're all kind of allowing ourselves to go into the kind of thoughts that we might have amongst ourselves or with very close friends, but actually in the room together, I, I felt was exciting and, you know, hopefully we can go on doing this. I mean, the beauty of free word is that we have a space which is designed exactly to try to promote this kind of conversation. So thank you again, free word, for facilitating today. We, we couldn't have managed it without your support. You know, we're a small organization and thank you so much. You really have um, uh, multiplied the sum of our parts or whatever our catchphrase is supposed to be. <laughs> I can never quite work it out. Um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then this afternoon, just opening it up and inviting other storytellers in. Hopefully that'll just leave us with a bit of inspiration. There's a bit of time, I think, for um, teas and coffees. This section of the day closes at four. So do, do you know, network, do, do have conversations with each other and just keep talking, really. That's all I know what to say, really. And, uh, we also, yep. and as I said earlier, we have, um, we have books on, um, 
from other speakers who have books uh, that are out there. Yeah. Um, do take them. I'm going to. Yeah, so, so uh, well, don't take them, buy them. Buy them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain Woo! that to me? Can you explain that to me? You guys did something to him. I don't know what it was. Don't take the books. <laughs> Why? Anyway. Right. I th is that it? I oh, think... And just thank you very, very, very much again uh, to the TLC team particularly. Mm. I won't go into it, but it's been a hell of a year for us. I was very, very ill earlier in the year. And basically, Aki and Joe saved the company. And, uh, you know, I can't thank them enough. And, you know, the fact that this day has come through is, is, is a miracle that not most of you need to know about. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you.